more Charter Review Commission meeting That's good. for February 21st, 2017. Um, we have a central mic, which should be picking everybody up, but just as a courtesy to Ms. Hubach or anyone else here, uh, let's make sure that we speak up enough that everybody can hear. With that being said, I will call the meeting to order and ask for a confirmation of quorum. Commissioners Wilson? Present. Ackley? Present. Burke? Present. Castleman? Present. Wiggins? Present. Hubach? Yes, present. Stidham? Present. Daring? Present. Moorhead? Present. Please stand for the pledge. Don't say Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Moving on to our minutes, I'll entertain a motion to dispose of the February 7th minutes. I'll second that. We have uh, Ms. Hubach moving and Burke seconding. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Passes unanimously. Moving on to unfinished business. We have two small items here that were residual from our last meeting, and we wanted some additional staff discussion. Um, starting with item A regarding, well, how about we do this? Item A dealing with section, subsection 4.4F regarding appointments. I'll turn to Mr. Zerk. I'm happy to provide a report with regard to the inquiry that, um, I believe I got the inquiry information right and I'm happy to provide additional follow-up if necessary. Um, the mayor and staff, or mayor powers and duties under subsection 4.4F regarding the appointments uh, there was a question raised with regard to uh, term limits for appointments for boards and commissions, and the second one with regard to the mayor's appointment power with the advice and consent of council. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, in going back through and looking at this, uh, the three that we have issue with are the PNZ, the Park Board, and the Arts Commission. Those are the ones that are specifically outlined uh, in statute that are provided for uh, that we utilize here, those have, um, those are specifically referenced in statute that they will be by the advice and consent of the council and at the recommendation of the mayor. So there is statutory authority for why the mayor has that power under the terms of our charter. We have adopted that by way of uh, the statutory authority. With regard to term limits for boards and commissions, I find nothing under the charter or statute which imposes term limits. Now, members of boards and commissions will have terms, three year, one year, four year, two year terms, but they can serve as many of those terms as they are so inclined or are capable of doing so, as long as the mayor and the council continue to go through that reappointment. Then are you saying when the park board puts a limitation on membership, they, they can't do that? Unless we want them to, no. I'm, I'm saying they can put that on, they can incorporate that limitation. But in fact, they've had it. But that well, the rule. The, the, park, the park board no longer has term limits. Right. They've, already, they've eliminated that. They eliminated that's right. that okay. several years ago. Uh, Mr. Zur, I, and I can't, I don't, I was thinking of something else, so I apologize, right. but I couldn't remember if you covered. Um, there is a limitation that does exist, though, that the council had voted on a pre, with a previous resolution that a person cannot sit on more than one board. That is there, so there is a limitation, it's just not related to term. And I have seen that in a number of cities as well, too. My home city of Independence has the same, a similar situation. Okay. Um, the issue regarding, and I, I'd like to stick with just a subsection A2 of the staff report regarding appointments with advice and consent. One of the discussion topics was that because we have a custom of the two council members in the ward making the initial recommendation to the mayor, that is something the mayor does not have to recognize. That is a courtesy that several previous mayors have allowed. The question was, should we codify this and make it a rule? And Mr. Burke, I believe you were the one that at least brought the topic up. Would you like to speak any further on that? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, we 
have not had a formal motion on that issue. Does anybody have any additional discussion, though? Uh, normally, we would discuss after a motion, but if it's only been brought by one person, unless unless you would like to offer a motion. I, I, I don't know that. I cannot remember the conversation last time if there was support for this idea or if it was an idea that was brought up that was unbeknownst to most people on the commission. Can anyone recall the discussion? I was here for a little of that. I know that I had talked about the history of it, kind of how mm -hmm. it's applied. Um, I also recognize that it does not violate our charter because the mayor, oh, it is merely a suggestion, to the, a non-binding suggestion to the mayor. The may, you know, it gives the mayor the opportunity to say, if the two people in that ward agree on that person, then I know I'm not going to get kickback on that particular person coming in who would fight it if they're the ones that suggested it. And it just made the transition smoother. But the mayor, we have had, even with the mayors who have acknowledged that, we've had both council members recommend someone and the mayor not move them forward, and that's still appropriate. But what happened then was there was a public hearing brought back by one of the council members, and they publicly humiliated the man that was on the board and refused to let him be served. Remember? Bob uh, Rowland? Yes. Yeah, although I will respectfully say, because I was the person that replaced Mr. Rowland as a result of that hearing, um, Mr. Rowland's conduct while on a committee helped precipitate some of those criticisms, um, only because I had members of that the Planning and Zoning Board express some concern. Uh, so I, I don't want to get to I, I I don't want to say it was without without merit. No, but the way in which it was done was very demeaning, not only to Mr. Rowland and to the mayor, but also to members of the council. We just, we didn't want to get into that kind of a situation. And we shouldn't okay. have to. If the mayor wants to make a, an appointment, even if it's a wrong appointment, do we let him make that appointment and we live with the results? Or do we put it in so that our will prevails <laughs> rather than his? I, I see this as a chicken and the egg situation because the mayor brings forth the person formally, but it's still by majority of the council to approve. So whether the council preempts the mayor's decision or not, I'm not sure it ne necessarily tips the balance of power there. I, I will say, yes, I do recall in the meeting, the format of the meeting was, was disrespectful. Yes, Mr. Stidham. I was just going to say that had that's what happened to me um, when I was appointed to the park board um, because of political or politics or political position. Uh, Mr. Stevens and Mr. Kellogg, neither one, uh, put me through. The mayor did, Mayor Kirkhoff, and the, the council voted six to two, and I went on the park board. But neither one of my own ward uh, aldermen uh, were for it. Okay. So, no, I'm not kidding. Can you hear me now? I'm not kidding. <laughs> I can't believe that people should really know about people wanting to volunteer. Yes, Mr. Burke. <clears throat> I, uh, part of me is hesitant to take <clears throat> more power away from the mayor since it is a council. Um, our, our charter is so, so uh, directed by the council for the most part. Um, and I think that in a situation like that, say um, if it was my ward and I wasn't happy with the mayor's um, appointment, I think I could bring that up in discussion and if I can give valid reasons that that person uh, shouldn't be on a board, then then that would be my, my, my duty. And if I can't convince everyone that there is a valid reason, then why wouldn't the mayor be able to appoint someone um, you know, I, th I think that's part of the, you know, the process. And but sometimes I think it's I think it's something that people have to watch and make sure that you don't just blanketly approve the um, 
the consent agenda. And, and I think those should be pulled from the consent agenda every time, um, whether it be for um, for everyone to, to honor that person who's being appointed um, or whether to uh, discuss their merits. Well, then again, I think we should also look at um, who we have looking at uh, uh, zoning, who's been on there since 2002, Jerry Faulkner. What's wrong with that? What if somebody else wants to step up and be a leader? They, they're out there's an application process. Has, and anybody step, has anybody ever stepped up to want to do that? There have been every year that the chair is voted upon, and every year it's a new election. And uh, the two years that I was on, no one else um, nominated anyone else for the chair. And I think he has done a brilliant job. In my personal opinion. Chair or on just that. a seat on Yeah, this. I think <coughs> Cause like I understand it would be more like just a seat. Because I, I have well, an application in, should somebody in my ward that yeah. is on P&Z work out. Correct. Yeah. So, so, I mean, yeah, an so application yeah. exists, so I'm... He, he's I'm, taking... So, he, if he, he's on that position, he's, he's taking a position right. in that ward, right? He is serving that position. He's not taking it. He is serving it. It's a volunteer position. He's... I spent several years learning. I learned quite a bit uh, with him running well, PNC. Well, an engineer, I understand that. But what I'm saying is that what if somebody else from his ward wants to also? That's the mayor and the council's prerogative. Uh, so if, if somebody fills out an application in his ward and the mayor decides it's time, and the council members decide it's time to get some fresh blood, that's up to them. It's not up to the individual sitting on. And I'd like to back that conversation up to more of a, a little broader than specifically Mr. Mm -hmm. Faulkner, because it yeah. does bring up a brief discussion that, um, because I don't think anybody's saying anything negative about Mr. Faulkner, actually, and I served with him, and I have great deal of respect for him. I, I, but I've there, known Jerry a long time, right. I'm just saying 15 years But there is a point where you, you say a lot of these half terms, where it'll be like three years. And even I myself have recently said, well, wait a second, I don't hear or see anything. And then all of a sudden, I have Thursday night, I get the agenda for the next Monday, and I find three consent agenda items reappointing people, some in Ward 2, and I'm going, the mayor never even gave me the courtesy call to say, hey, do you want to re-up this person? Because there, maybe there is kind of a rationale of, even with quality, sometimes you gotta, you got to kind of change people out. I mean, even George Brett took a day off occasionally. So the idea, well, what maybe, do you guys think of that? Maybe even like, you know, 10, yeah, 10 years or something, you know? 15 yeah. is quite a long time. One of the things that concerns me is I think the mayor should be allowed to make the appointments because suppose the council doesn't approve of that one. We can get into a good old boys system to where we don't want any outside information, any outside people coming in who might rock the boat, and I don't think that's right. That's why I, I would be in favor of letting the mayor have the final say on that, because if he appoints somebody that seems to be a little out of the mainstream, maybe that's, that department needs to be shaken up a little bit. I don't know. But I think that's the chicken and the egg that Mr. Moorhead was talking about, too, because the mayor could say if both of them, or you and your ward, agree on something, the mayor said, no, I want my guy in there. So, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a two-headed snake, <clears throat> any way you look at it. So, are, are we, I guess I'm just a little confused, because we started talking about term limits, sort of, which is section, Article 8, so, which we've done this before, we kind of go ahead of ourselves, so. Well, I'm in the, in the agenda, though. No, I know, and so, it is are we, are, are we <clears throat> discussing whether or not the advice and consent should be a mandatory thing, because, Obviously, whether there's an additional step, right? Because because you were saying it's kind of been the unwritten rule. Do we want to make it a written rule? Is that more what that's, we're discussing? That's the first question. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Do we codify the custom, or do we allow the mayor to be the first recommendation? And if he wishes on his own to say, "Hey, you two, what do you think?" I mean, I'm bad. I'm in Ward Two. I don't know everybody. I mean, I interact more with people in Ward 2, 
So by nature, you know, I, when I see issues that come up and I see residents' names, sometimes I literally have to go and try to seek out. I've gone to county records. You know, where the hell do they live? Are they in my ward? So uh, it's hard for me to speak outside of my ward. I think if I was in that situation, it would be my duty to try to convince the rest of the body why my reasoning uh, is, is superior to the mayor's reasoning on that particular appointment. And that's part of the political process is trying to come to consensus. If I don't say anything as, as a council member on, that, on a position um, that's being appointed, then that's on me. If I don't try, and, and if I try and fail, then that's the process. But can that be accomplished after the mayor did his appointment when the council has advice and consent, though? That's what I was. So do we need the initial recommendation to the mayor, or do we allow each mayor to choose how they wish to receive potential applicants? Because what if you have two politically aligned ward members and you have a volunteer who would be fully qualified but maybe isn't so politically aligned that gets boxed out and it's like, well, I'd like to volunteer, but I gotta wait until two other guys get elected off. I when I brought this up I just wanted to know whether it was actually a policy or was it a custom? And uh, it's a custom. I feel like that I've gotten that question answered. So are we willing to move past that point? Yes. Okay, fair Aye. enough. Um, there's, under the staff report, there is regarding term limits. Mr. Zerg, do you want to go ahead and have any additional on that, or are you comfortable with your earlier comment? Uh, I'm fine maybe with my uh, former comment. There's nothing that would prohibit the imposition of term limits, but the reference within all the statutory provisions and the uh, current code provisions are basically that uh, there is no imposed term limit on boards or commissions, there are terms identified. Okay, and Ms. Deering brought up the issue of a mayor, a member who has served a significant period of time. And if you look at all our boards, we have a couple other members who have maybe not quite that length, but are also a little long, a lo longer than the average. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Should there be a requirement to spread the wealth? Or I think one of the issues you could potentially encounter, um, and obviously I'm not well versed in um, the history of the various boards and committees, but you know, if traditionally if people aren't volunteering all that much, then you kind of get into a point where you end up having somebody that sits in a seat for a long time. However, by imposing term limits, if you have somebody that is uh, exceptionally qualified for the position because of their personal and professional background, such as somebody that maybe is an engineer or an architect, somebody that would have advanced knowledge that would be helpful for the PNZ, and you don't really have, so let's say, you know, they, they live in Ward 1, and well, it's time for them to kind of come up and, and go, because they've served two, ter three year terms or whatever, and then all of a sudden, the only person from Ward 1 is, you know, Jim Bob Joe Beam, who doesn't know a squat and just wants a whole bunch of McDonald's and Taco Bells around the town. Obviously, maybe wouldn't get confirmed, but if you're forcing somebody off and there's only one person to replace them with, you're kind of between a rock and a hard place. And so, well, over. Have any applicants? Do we have a lot of applicants? What do? I mean, it probably depends on the committee. Now there are at least two. Well, but it depends on the committee. P and Z, maybe, yeah, but Park Board, Arts, Tree, I mean, whatever, however many boards there are, I imagine some of those, the. Uh, the pond is pretty shallow um, as far as replacement. When we were smaller, we took them from so many from each ward, but we have grown past that and we've got some very talented people in our community. And I'm wondering sometimes should we put a second rate person in one ward when if it, uh, we have this first class person that can go in, but because they're in the wrong ward, they can't go in. Should we eliminate that as a requirement that we have to have so many from each ward and use the quality of the individual that's applying rather than the board resident. But people are moving around so much inside of Raymore. 
Well, not as the chair, but as, as a member, I would say I'm, I'm very hesitant about that type of option, only because it, a lot of times, what are our criteria that we value? Well, education, experience, and skill are typically three key variables. Well, you tend to, you tend to find people working in their fields that have strong skill, knowledge, and experience tend to be more affluent. Well, then what you're going to get is you're going to get the four or five affluent pockets of the community holding all the seats because somebody who may have a lot to offer but may not be conventionally the definition of a good candidate gets boxed out. This way it spreads the wealth. You touch all four corners. Well, the reason I bring it up is because years ago, I was the one that, su that suggested and insisted as a, as a taxpayer citizen that we have them based on the wards. And we've gone past that now, and I'm just wondering if I was wrong all those years, and if maybe we should go back to where whoever qualifies is the one that gets on it. The other fear I have is if you get a strong candidate or a strong representative on the dais, they could fill almost every seat with every one of their friends because of their strong push to get candidates mm -hmm. on there. So I think every ward should at least have a chance and a seat at the table. Oh, Ms. Gary. It doesn't, so it's not, each ward isn't represented right now? Yes, they are. They are. Yeah. They, we have a couple where we have an odd number where we have a couple of at-large seats. Park Board has an at-large seat, and I take that back. I believe, is it the TIF Commission that is not designated by ward? Only that actually the, the Arts Commission, the Planning and Zoning Commission, the uh, <coughs> Park Board, PNZ, Park PNZ, Board PNZ, yeah. those three Park are, Park are, are the only ones with every, board All the other committees and all the other commissions are just a number of people in that long. Yeah, the choice of Right. I'm sorry, I thought we... No, I didn't want to... No, I didn't have anything. Thank you. So, okay, so as to the issue of term limits, though, you know, I will, I'll, I'll throw out a personal thing that I've had to deal with over the last five years. I, the moment I took office, there was obviously, I vacated the Planning and Zoning Commission. So there was an empty seat. And I contacted the city clerk and I asked for applications. I don't remember the exact amount, but there, I think there were one or two that were in there. And over the last five years, um, the clerk's office will disseminate out when they hear about a volunteer application. That's not kept quiet in a file, so we're given notice. And the problem is, is I've seen cyclical movements between wards. Sometimes it's ward two that has six or eight suddenly appear, then ward three the next year. It's not the same. It's a very ebb and flow. And the problem is, is I've had a just it's a weird stroke of luck because normally we kind of have it, again, this is a custom, where we'll get people on there and we like them and everybody's doing a good job. And I mean, right now, our park board, our arts commission, our planning and zoning are really humming. So when stuff comes up, for example, I believe we have a couple coming up here in either Mar or April or May, I think it's park board, where do you, not, do you just arbitrarily <coughs> kick them off when everything's running so smoothly and they've been working to, uh, you know, we have a new park house that's being designed. So they've worked with a lot of meetings, a lot of consultants. So it becomes very difficult. I had one member come up to me at a co community conversation, <coughs> hugged me, thanked me how wonderful it was to be serve and to be, and that I had faith in that person and how much they're enjoying it. And they were coming up the next year. Well, you know, you're kind of going, now I feel like I kind of, you know, it's a feel-good story, so you want to keep them on. The problem is, did I go back to that applicant pool and tear through there and go, okay, coldly and objectively, who would be the best person? No, I went po totally on emotion. Maybe I shouldn't have, but I'm being honest about it. And so the problem is, is we do have a custom and a history, once you're on, you almost have to kind of earn off. You either have to quit or move.
move or <coughs> have a problem because we just keep consenting them through and kind of reappointing them unless a mayor gets mad at them. And so maybe that my story justifies maybe we should set a term limit. Maybe not. I mean, I will say, though, the boards that we keep these people perpetuated on seem to be doing a pretty good job. And so it's hard to justify changing out just for the, you know, you feel like you're giving it an oil change when you just did it a month ago. Yeah, you drove 3,000 miles, but, you know, it just doesn't feel like you should have to. Mr. Burke. The uh, last volunteer application that, that we were notified about was January 17th. And it just so happened it was one of my former students from science back in the 90s here in Ray Peck um, and contacted me and said, hey, how, I know you're on, I know you're my um, council member, you're one of my council councilmen from, from my ward, um, how, does one, how does somebody get more involved? And so I told her, I said, well, I don't think there are any openings currently, but there's and I, because I knew her, I'm like, you would be great for the Arts Commission if there's an opening someday. She was very active in theater and, and things like that and continued to do so after high school. Um, but she went ahead and, and uh, signed up for the Park Board and the Arts Commission. And, um, you know, she may not ever get to serve. And I know there are other examples like that. But, um, you know, that's just kind of... Be, until there's a person that's not attending meetings or not doing their their job on, on the board that's currently serving, I don't see a reason that even though I think I know her and I've talked to her for 10 years, um, you know, I think she'd do a great job, but I don't know that she would do better than somebody that's already been there for a while and has actually <coughs> learned what they do, and so I did suggest to her that you should go to go to some of these meetings, these commission meetings, and sit in and see if it really is something you're interested in. And um, and I'm I'm hoping that that I will hear that that's the case. But any other thoughts? I mean, right now we kind of have a you have to you you need to deserve to be fired to be to be removed. Um, just the problem is, is not many deserve to be fired. Uh, we've had, like I said, very good luck. And at what criteria should you then say, um, and respectfully, Mr. Kastman, I know you've served on, uh, on a board. If you don't mind me using you as a hypothetical, it, you're not in my ward, so I'm saying this. But when you come up for reconsideration, um, is it necessarily best practice to say, well, Mr. Kessman has done all these different things, but you know what, I ought to go back to the list and see if I can find somebody better. Isn't that kind of like dating somebody and always wishing you were dating somebody else? I mean, you, you know, it gets to be an awkward situation there where you're putting a criteria on somebody that's not necessarily respectful or appropriate. Well, the last time I came up for re uh, reappointment, uh, there were two other applicants in Ward 1, uh, Councilman Kellogg, and uh, had said that they were reviewing. I don't know what the outcome, obviously I was reappointed, but I'm not sure what their qualifications or interests were or background. Uh, the current Park Board has, I think, almost across the board people who have past experience with the issue of recreation, uh, youth activities, health, welfare. Uh, community activity, not to say that they're not others. And we've always kind of used the measurement uh, of people we observe who attend park board meetings or express interest after the fact, uh, get involved on a peripheral of it. And quite often the number of those will float to the surface, so to speak, and might find their way on the board. But what criteria says somebody's better than you? Uh, I don't know if it would be better, it may be broader. Uh, Maurice Ballman, Maurice left the park board to get more involved with Boy Scouts. And much of his base prior to that was youth activities, but he stepped away from the park board to yet another recreational youth community family activity. Sometimes it's a matter of interest. Okay. Other thoughts? Well, I was a park board for a couple of 
couple of years, and the reason I stepped away was to run for city council. I mean, I think that's I think that's how it should be done. I think you should serve on one of the, one of the boards to kind of see how things are run, and then you begin to run for city council. You gotta okay. figure out. You gotta learn how things are done. That's that's why I think. It's my personal opinion. Here we have a governor and a president that haven't done anything in the way of any kind of experience in the government, and now we're now we have, there are leaders. Yeah. Well, but to to play. To give you a counterpoint playfully. I mean, I so should Jerry Faulkner clearly run for council next? He could. Because he's been on there so far. He could. That's true. I don't, think, That's he, true. I don't think he's interested. But. Right. But so does that create a logjam, though? Is that a logjam we need to worry about? Or do we allow the natural ebb and flow of interest to continue to kind of organically decide? Today, I, I wouldn't, you know. Today, maybe not. Five years from now, uh, when we hit 25,000 or 30,000 or 35,000, you may have a lot of applicants on there. You may have people that may not fit your personal representative's parameters. You may have somebody that the mayor might not like, want to go on that board. Um, but I think at some point in time, we're going to have to look at you know, turning the pond over, draining the swamp. Uh, <laughs> Any additional thoughts, <laughs> Mr. Kessler? Uh, to go back to my own personal history, when I was on the commission in Grandview, I was on the commission for 11 years there. I replaced Jane Gibbard, who had been on for 20 <coughs> years. Jane started the Parks Department in Grandview. Well, I was an at-large member, and my mandate, I was told, was to promote youth activities. We had a member of the Board of Aldermen. We had a member of the school board. These were things that were mandatory positions. And they represented and coordinated all the issues. And there was constantly input from all different directions. And it was quite a good churn going there. Everybody had a mandate. Well, I'll make one last comment. Um, my situation is unique because um, I intended to run for the council, uh, having previous uh, political experience. And the two members in my ward who didn't want me to run against them put me on planning and zoning to avoid me running against them and then two years later the lat the, the one remaining I said just to let you know next year I'm unseating you and then he went on to another position and I was able to step up into it so um, I kind of shoved my way up onto the council so much <laughs> as waiting to be appointed but uh, I'm not sure if I'm, that comment necessarily aids or helps the determination of whether term limits should go into effect. But uh, I'm not hearing anybody. I'm not hearing a real consensus for a motion, unless somebody would like to make one. Well, I'm not going to make a motion, but I'm just going to ask: What about enlarging the existing committee? For instance, on park, not park, but uh, planning and zoning. We have eight, and we can have up to 15. I think the, the state statute says seven to 15. So we could increase the number of people that are on there, the new blood as you want to talk about. We could do that in the same way with some of the others. That is a very good idea. Respectfully, though, that is outside of the charter, and that can be done either through codes, or that would actually be something for a work session that the council can talk about and I believe by resolution or ordinance, it uh, should be done ordinance. But it's section 89.320 that allows for not more than 15 nor less than five citizens appointed for this planning zone. So, Ms. Hubeck, that might be something we need to take into consideration on a Monday night. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Okay, um, not seeing a, a desire for a motion on this, we'll move on to item B and on 4.4H to remit fines and forfeitures. And grant reprieves and pardons, Mr. Sir. I was very excited about this particular research topic. <laughs> <laughs> I was excited with this research topic because it allowed me to use my political Wait, science and history see. degree going back to Alexander Hamilton and the Federalist number 74. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so Alexander Hamilton has the Federalist number 74 published in March of two uh, sorry, March of 1788, where he first brings up the issue with regard to pardon authority. 
And his exact quote was, the president shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States except in cases of impeachment. As you all know, that is still a federal authority for the president to utilize. President Washington used the pardon after the suppression of the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794. Uh, and notably, Gerald Ford utilized it for Richard Nixon. We have uh, Bill Clinton utilizing it for his brother. President James Madison pardoned the Army deserters in an attempt to refill the military ranks following the War of 1812. Abraham Lincoln pardoned all Civil War deserters on the condition that they return to their units. And President Carter pardoned the Vietnam War draft dodgers to help the long healing process for the nation during after the war. So that is a short historical analysis for you. It is provided for both at federal level for the president as well as state level for governors and in most of our cities. Uh, I would note for you that the language we have there is drawn very similarly from the uh, Missouri Revised Statutes for Fourth Class Cities, 79.220, which grants the mayor shall have the, apport, the power to remit fines and forfeitures and to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses arising under the ordinance of the city. So you will find very, very similar language there that you would within our mater current materials. In my review of local provisions, I would note that many of the cities that I looked at, and I, I just pulled a, a group of them, I've got Independence and Belton both have similar. Kansas City had an interesting one there. The Kansas City pardon and parole was, the mayor shall have the authority upon the written recommendation of the director of the department overseeing municipal corrections to parole any person convicted. I'm not sharing that for purposes of suggesting that that's a good option for you. I just simply note that was some deviation from the absolute power of, hey, the mayor has the authority. One of the other questions that came up in the review of this, so what I would tell you is, at least up front, um, it, it appears to be pretty well accepted at all levels of government. Uh, there is no specific case law on the issue as to whether or not one should be prohibited or where it's been utilized. Uh, and the only language that I would note for any consideration is one of the aspects to this was due to the most recent ruling for Rule 37 and Senate Bill 5, should the mayor be allowed to continue with the pardon authority, or does that mean a crossover of an overlap of the, of the judiciary's power? Um, I went back in and looked at Rule 37 as it's been recently adopted, which relates to uh, uh, Senate Bill 5. Senate Bill 5 was adopted a couple of years ago in response to the issues in Ferguson. I see people shaking their head in agreement around the table, understanding that when Ferguson riots occurred, uh, governor sent in individuals in order to try and straighten out the city of Ferguson in, in their view, and in doing so also revamp their municipal court. They were utilizing their municipal, municipal court for fundraising purposes, and it was being, their, their court charges and fees were being applied in inappropriate manners. So the Senate Bill 5 was the legislature's effort to kind of pull all of the cities back into alliance, even though I think what you would find is the vast majority of the cities were doing just fine. It was uh, Ferguson as being an outlier for it. That's a personal commentary, I suspect. Uh, that being said, Senate Bill 5 does have certain provisions. It provides that judges and court personnel are not subject to informal pressure, discipline, firing, or threats of non-retention or non-reappointment resulting from the performance of their judicial duties in a manner that upholds the independence of the judiciary. Similarly, court personnel and judges are not subject to informal pressure, discipline, firing, or threats uh, for purposes of being able to maximize the revenue within the court system. And what I would note here is the pardon provision differs from having the mayor muck his hands into the judiciary's ongoing activities. This would be after the judiciary had acted, uh, after a determination had been made. Uh, so it differs from an executive branch uh, trying to uh, influence the judiciary branch. The judiciary has already acted. The conclusion of the case has been met. The mayor pardons things for correction of injustice that he views or, as you can tell from the historical aspect, to exercise the power for some public policy purpose. Um, so if you ask, hey, based upon the rulings for Senate Bill 5 and Rule 37, do we need to change this? My answer is it's not a conflict that we would need to address at this particular point. Uh, 
Um, and it appears to be relatively accepted throughout most of the cities in the state as well as your state and federal level. That's my report. Mr. Wilson, I believe you were the one who kind of initiated this, so I'm going to give you the opportunity if you want to step back in on it. What forms of government do independents and these other communities that you mentioned have? Independence has a charter. Belton has a charter. Right. I'm, I'm, I know the independence has a charter. Yes, Belton has Belton, a charter. Belton is also a charter form of government. With, with uh, the mayor having power other than uh, what we're talking about allowing our mayor to have? All of them are, all of them will have differing, I guess is what I would say, power, uh, depending upon what was adopted in terms of the charter. The mayor council and independence is a relatively strong council and independence. If the mayor was in disagreement with the current police chief over a pardon or a, 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 uh, an arrest of some sort, um, after it goes through our judicial system, is the only time he could he could give his blessing to have someone pardon. Is that right? Yes. There so would he's have not to be allowed to go to a prosecutor and ask for a case to be dismissed or anything prior to the if he judge's does that, decision or, okay. right if he does that he has violated rule 37 in senate bill 5 if he waits till the case is concluded and there is a judgment entered against that individual or a conviction uh, or a guilty plea entered uh, he could he could pardon that guilty plea but he can't mess with the determination of the judge during the course of it nor is he capable of stepping in in order to exert influence over the prosecutor and what the prosecutor should be doing um, who has within our council has the power to hire and fire the chief of police for our city? That's you. Just me. You do? City manager. Only you. Unless you have a uh, re recall. Well, actually, I have the power to hire the chief of police, and only I have the power to hire the chief of police. <coughs> to terminate the chief state statutes that are in place, the chief could, on that termination, agree to the council automatically. In fact, it's an automatic grievance to the council. I think that state statute was passed last year. Protecting all the chiefs. Of, first, it went into place for Chief Forte and Police Chief of the City of St. Louis, and then it went into place for all the chiefs of the state. You can't do a recall anymore? Is there a waiting period before a mayor can do this? Um, not according to our charter. Okay. He has to wait until the judgment becomes final. Yes. But after that. But after that time frame. Yeah, because the judgment has to be in effect because there's nothing to pardon because that person has not been convicted yet. Yeah. Right. But after the judgment. There's... Interestingly enough, as part of the research for it, the mayor could potentially pardon an individual even if that individual had not requested or desired to be pardoned from us. So there are presidential pardons that have gone through that are the individual who received it did not want it. So that, actually, no, and that actually happened last year. There was an individual that requested that his pardon be uh, rescinded. <laughs> Unpardoned. <laughs> be, well, because <laughs> he, the, the nature of the pardon, which would actually <laughs> cost him to stay, because he was about to be released from jail, he would have had to stay in longer with additional probationary terms as a condition of the pardon. So the pardon actually extended what was already granted to him. So um, the only comment I have on this, and especially you know, with a lot that the council has done regarding Senate Bill 5 and 572, is our court system has really divided up and made sure we have separation of power, a clear separation of power at the municipal level. And the, you know, as a practicing attorney, I'm not gonna deny to you that how much I've ever talked to mayors, I've talked to city councilmen, I've talked to prosecutors, I've even had clerks, uh, court clerks make ruling, doing things. I mean, it, it, you go into some of these jurisdictions and it's literally a mobile home and Every 
every room serves three different offices. So, you know, it, it gets very interwoven. And this, these rules that are mandated really pull our court system away from the administrative or executive side, where really the mayor and council have no ability to intersect with a bad court. I mean, at some point we can hear about things going wrong, we can potentially remove the judge and the prosecutor, but that's after damage has already been done. So that particular defendant gets no recourse. So it's a very, it puts, puts us in a substantially more reactive role. Well, one of the reasons for the pardon historically is to grant a, a proactive approach to that individual defendant. I mean, if you think about it, seven million people in Missouri, one criminal defendant and seven million against one, how do you balance the scale? Well, you do it by creating burdens of proof on the, on the, pro, the state first and, and some additional burdens that they have to kind of create balance, make sure that you grant legal counsel. Well, one of them is, is if you have a maverick court, you have to, who, what's the recourse against a maverick court? because the legislative body can't do anything, that's where the pardon came in. And we, I saw this early on in my law practice. Uh, the court, uh, there was a young judge put on the Jackson County bench. She had been through a divorce just before she became a judge. And the first 60 days, she ruled against 15 men in divorces. Gave the wife everything. Literally said to the men, you got the car you drove here in. And all of them went up on appeal. It showed bias, clear bias. She was removed and can never serve on that uh, type of bench again as a sanction. And well, the, the only recourse was the ability to have somebody go in and overturn those issues if it were in a criminal fashion. So, and my example with the judge was civil, but, but if it were criminal, the pardon is what grants the check and balance. Now that our court system is being more separated, how, how do we keep Mr. Marshall and Mr. Nigro appropriate? I think some of the issue in Ferguson could have been solved if the council, because the council was not very strong, if the mayor would have stepped up and if these rules were in place and said, no, we, we've got some bad conduct here, we need to change this stepped up and started overturning some of these decisions that might have helped. Any other thoughts? I, I guess I have one final sure. thought and it's not in any way meant to be any disrespectful to our current mayor because he has a tremendous history in the criminal justice side. But I just, uh, if, if we're saying that, that he is here to cut ribbons and uh, do such non-legal matters, be involved in such non-legal matters. How does that justify him being able to pardon someone? Uh, and like I said, I, I think he completely has a tremendous grasp on the community of uh, criminal justice system, and that, I don't ever foresee that being a problem. It's just that it seems kind of a contradictory that we're going to give him in one hand all this power to be able to make this legal decision to override the criminal the justice system but yet on the other hand his his major accomplishments of mayor seem to be cutting ribbons and signing uh, well, documents like that keep in know. mind that roughly two years from now you could have a different mayor who doesn't have such an esteemed polished background as far as political and police and whatever experiences, so. Well, the, it, we, we, again, when you look at the three branches of government, the council kind of serves from a legislative standpoint. Our courts, the judicial, the mayor is really the, the lone executive. So who, who, who would be in a better position? Just open-ended. Do we need a position? I mean, well, is it yeah. the checks and balances side by giving them the position to make sure that the judges aren't, like you were saying, the, overstepping their bounds? Do we allow the mayor to do it with the advice and consent of the council? Or, I mean, 
whether the propositions is completely abolished. I don't know that, uh, yeah, I certainly agree that there needs to be a check and balance system. I don't know that, I, I, I just am concerned that here we have kind of agreed to equate our mayor as just kind of a puppet in our, in our local government and yet we give them, all of a sudden just out of the clear blue, we give him the power to pardon someone that we have to have faith in our judicial system that they make the right decisions based on the evidence and, and the proceedings that that they are based on. Uh, why would we allow someone such as Matt just brought up that may have not have any legal background that just comes in and says, yeah, let's just pardon him. Uh, I don't like the DWIs and let's just pardon him because he was convicted from a DWI. Fair enough. Mr. I think if, uh, and if you, if you look at our city, the, the council is really the legislative branch, the mayor is the executive, and I think it would be very easy for a council to put tremendous pressure all the way to a recall initiative on a mayor that was doing things that were egregious against the law. And I think you could spend your time at the end of every uh, city council meeting bringing it up every week until and putting it down on Facebook and going to people's doors and you could do a lot to stop any kind of action that was that was not uh, appropriate through the political process and most mayors would not I, I can't I can't imagine that that our current mayor would pardon anyone and I really don't think that our previous mayor would have pardoned anyone um, but maybe I would be wrong but if, if it was deemed to be inappropriate by enough citizenry, it'd be very easy to work to put a change in that executive branch. But what would be inappropriate if they're convicted already? I mean, wouldn't that in and of itself um, be defined inappropriate? It would be the burden of the person making the case, just like I, it would be my burden back to the previous issue if I didn't like who was being appointed from Ward 2, it would be my duty to speak up and try to change the opinions of the people that can make those decisions. And if I felt strongly enough, I certainly would go to my constituents and get hundreds of people to come up and speak to that and block any legislative action until things were corrected. It would be very easy to, if something was so egregious, it would be very easy to get people involved because it wouldn't take much to explain to someone, well, here's the situation, here's what happened, how do you feel about that? You don't like it? We need you to come up and speak. I, I want to counter that, but okay. Mr. Kassler first. Yeah, I want to piggyback on what Joe was saying, because there's a check here that he must make it public. After the fact, though. Yeah, but and that's potential for recall. It, 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 Absolutely. It, it would uh, suggest there's going to be review of what might appear to be an arbitrary decision. Uh, he's not going to do this and throw it into silence and people walk away from it. I, I think that would be the biggest test and the option of recalling any other remedies that might float to the surface. Mr. Mr. Rich, the investment advisor for the Clintons in the, in the late 90s, prime example. Right. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to give you guys a scenario though because you, once a person is convicted, you can't go back and legislate away the conviction. That's the problem. So even if you see a conviction that is heinous, and you say we're going to fix this, yes, the political process I'm only talking about the fix party. it in the future. But I'll give you a prime example. In the late '90s, I represented a lot of. Uh, we implemented a lot of sexual predator acts. Um, Megan's law in California. Well, the Stephanie Schmidt law in Kansas. I represent and know the families of Stephanie Schmidt who was the young girl on her 21st birthday in, the Wich in Wichita who got a ride from one of the uh, Pete Cooks home and he took her out and raped and murdered her. And so the state of Kansas, since no other states had sexual predator laws, socially the pendulum swung too far. Every state, how fast can we get a sexual predator law on the books to, come, to combat this problem? 
well, it goes out to California with Megan's Law. So at the time, it was a crime to, and, and you were, it was a sex offense to possess child pornography. So law enforcement puts on a FedEx uniform, has child pornography in a sealed FedEx envelope, goes to deliver it to a known pedophile who they're going to arrest. So they're, they're good to go. Problem is, they went to the neighbor's house. How many of you have ever signed for a UPS or FedEx package without looking at the address on it first? Don't you typically reach for the clipboard before you reach for the package? Well, what happened was, is she didn't think it was a little old lady. She opened up the door, handed her the package, she handed the clip, signed it, took it in her hand. She didn't have to know it was in there, boom, arrested, convicted of a felony, and was a registered sex offender until somebody said, well, wait a second, she didn't knowingly possess. This is a loophole. We need to change it. Legislature went into effect. Next session, change the law. Great. She's in prison. How do you fix it? The only solution, because here's the problem. The court system did exactly what they were supposed to do. The court system wasn't maverick. The legislature created the law. She was convicted under a valid law. So it's not even so much, a, it's, it's almost like a multi-tiered correction of a wrong. This governor was able to go in and pardon her, recognizing that that was not what the legislative intent was, and clearly this woman was not a sex offender, and that was the only way to correct that problem. So it be, there, once somebody gets into the criminal system and rides that chain of the justice system, the legislative branch no longer participates. They're done. Whatever laws they created at that time, they're in place. And the executive branch is out with the exception of the pardon. So it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you are affirming my position that the pardon is a necessary function of checks and balances. And then the check and balance of recalls is another check and balance of that particular position. Well, I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm countering. And oh, okay, that okay. I didn't, I didn't. Discussion. I thought you were saying it was. In, it, it is in consistent, to what but I said. I'm not trying to negate okay. the position that Mr. Wilson is asserting. I'm just throwing that out for saying discussion. Something to what I said, Mr. Castleman, did you want? Yeah, to? that's the scenario I was seeing. That the mayor decided he's going to excuse the DUI, and the city council or the public says, "Well, why?" And he has to explain it, and finds out that the excused DUI is his cousin. If that's not disclosed, it'll be pardoned, but by the way, you're doing this to your cousin, well, then the wheel starts turning in the other direction. That's where that public notice, I think, will be a, a saving buffer, can be a saving buffer. I tell you what, we, uh, do we have a motion to present on this? I move that we keep it in there because we've never used it in a hundred years. But it's there and if an emergency comes up and we're covered. I second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Sure. We're technically affirming, sure. even though the discussion was initiated as a, a removal. So yes. we're not making any adjustments at all to it whatsoever? We haven't <laughs> voted on that yet. But that's what the motion the is, motion is to, to the leave the it as is. The motion is to leave it as is. Oh. I don't know why you would need a motion and a second on that, except just to move on to the next issue. Well, I was looking for a motion to remove or kill it by silence, but we do have a motion, and it is technically <laughs> a, 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 a good motion. It's maybe a little different, but it is a good motion. So there is a good motion that's second on the table, but now we're to the point of discussion. Anybody who wishes it to go the other way, this is the time to kind of assert up to defeat this motion, um, which would obviously then lead to a counter motion. Mr. Wilson, I hate to put you on the spot here, but what's your thoughts? Uh, I'm in, I would support the motion on the board session. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? It passes unanimously. We move on. Technically, we have other it uh, items under new business A and B that are actually not new business. Um, we are moving on to item C, Article 5 for the city manager. So we are past the mayor. 
Okay, now let's pick on Mr. Fearborn Knight. Um, obviously, Section 5.1, Appointment and Term. Anybody have any preliminary thoughts on this section? I have a question. Yes. Uh, it's using the term acting city manager. Should that, is there acting or should that be the assistant city manager? Uh, there are instances where we have, matter of fact, Mr. Fearborn, when Mr. Berlin left, he was for a short time the acting city manager because he was the assistant that moved up. But he had, he was granted at that point the authority to act in all the capacities okay. of the city manager until he was formally named. Okay. I was wondering there was a period of time when the city manager was a city administrator. I didn't know if there was some confusion. Or no, this is just to cover okay. if, if there's any interim gap. Um, one of the issues here that has come up for discussion, um, if you look on the fifth line, the f starting sentence, the person appointed shall serve for an indefinite term. This was actually an issue of concern during a previous uh, <coughs> city manager because, and, and this was, I don't want to get into anything personal about that other than to say, one of the discussion points was it almost makes it almost impossible to fire them for the, or replace them for the following reason. Typically, we can have as many as one half of our council coming back up every April. And so the problem is we do the evaluations for the city manager and really address offering the contract in the month prior to the election. Mm -hmm. So the dilemma is is in many, in, we've had some instances where we were approving the any contract amendment with the city manager with the new council members. Well, a new council member is not going to step in. The first thing he does is go, you're fired. So here's the problem. How do you get six or more to fire? Because it requires six of eight. Well, you've got two, com two to four coming in or zero to four, but you could have anybody new is instinctively not going to say fire unless they have some pre preconceived bias coming in. So you've almost killed it just by the way we structure when we handle any evaluations for the city manager. And maybe we should move the city manager evaluation to a different time. That might affect it to where new people coming in aren't new and they have at least some period of time. Um, but at some point, that became a discussion amongst the council in several years of going through evaluations. What are your thoughts? Um, when I was appointed, it was January, and I knew that I would need to run again in a few months. Um, and we had our evaluation. And I abstained from the evaluation process because I had only been sworn in for a week or two, and I didn't feel that I was qualified to make any kind of a judgment on somebody that I hadn't worked with for very many days. Um, and so it does make me think, what if it was, well, I guess we, we are, we do the evaluations in February. And um, so it would be rare that there would be that many new appointments, but it would have been very difficult at that particular moment to get six out of eight if there was a, if there was a situation then, um, knowing that one person was abstaining. But at the time, I was so new, I didn't even know that it would take six of eight to uh, do anything like that. So that kind of makes me feel like I did the right thing in abstaining, because I didn't even know the process yet. Um, but your comment making me think about maybe moving the evaluation to, say, August or September, when no one is, I would feel as fearful of re-election attempts, um, might be a better time frame. Mr. Morgan? <clears throat> kind of add on to that, because uh, I, I definitely agree that moving it earlier or later, however you want to con consider it, would be one way. but. Yeah, I, I had a note in here uh, that I made that was wondering if this should 
be changed to read five of eight from six. Not necessarily indicative of present company, but should, um, like you said, it, it makes it almost impossible, but yet back here, all the changes we made were five of eight from six of eight for the other council you know, powers and positions. So that was kind of my note there to kind of add on to that, because if it is difficult, almost impossible, with a six of eight, moving it to five of eight makes it a little easier if needed, but it also would then align this section with the previous sections where we've adjusted everything to be five of eight majority as but, well. So just but you've got a problem then if you're gonna let the mayor have a vote on that, then whose place does he take when it has to be five of eight? There he's not a member of the council, but you put him in there and so whose place did he take? That's what my question has always been. Who who does he replace when it says five of eight, four of eight, six sure. of eight, or whatever it says, who does he replace? Well didn't didn't we define the entire council as just yes, the council that's, members that's only? Just thinking, yeah. The yeah. mayor is exempt when it because it says right here. No, the entire the entire council in, includes the mayor. the mayor. The city well, council is just the eight. Right, right when, here it says we spoke members of the entire we've city council. That definition. Right, oh, yeah. he's not, he's In the beginning of this, council. we right, have so said that the entire council is the eight plus the mayor. Yes. Now the mm -hmm. mayor would not vote unless there was a tie, so it would become five of nine if it were entire council. I just want to remind we did yeah. change the definition of that. <laughs> shall vote in case of a tie with the exception of the hiring and firing of the city attorney, city prosecuting attorney, city manager. It doesn't matter. Oh, no, no, that's right. <coughs> got it. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I know this has got to be a fun conversation to sit in because we're discussing why, why isn't it easier to fire the city attorney. But, uh, so I appreciate you having some things in here. Well, Mr. Wiggins' point is a separate issue, completely valid. Right. Well, that was the piggyback session. And trying to piggyback it on but that. They do, but they do interchange over the general theme of how easy or difficult should it be to, to hire and fire the city manager. Any other, any other input or thoughts? Well, I think what we decided was that uh, it, we wanted that super majority because if the, the council was that evenly divided, then the people would be evenly divided and we did not want to create a problem. So that was, as I understood it, that was one of the reasons that we had it. We, for a number of times, we thought that if the mayor had to make the recommendation to fire, but as I read it in there and the attorney agreed, the council on their own initiative <coughs> can recommend that the city manager be fired. It doesn't have to have the um, uh, mayor's approval to start the process. Well, that's correct. And this section specifically does say that it, it, uh, if you look on the sixth sentence, the city manager may, may be removed with the consent of six out of eight members of the entire council. The mayor is not a part of that. That's right. So that's fine. Um, I, I want to make sure we keep our issues slightly separate, though. Uh, five of eight, six of eight is an important discussion, but then it becomes exponentially difficult when you infer that there is, is an indefinite term. Right. And, and for me, I, I, I think there's an, we need to discuss five versus six, whether we're too soft or hard. <coughs> But the indefinite term is a whole different concern. Uh, my, and I draw a similarity with our school board, because our school board right now, the, the superintendent is on a finite term of a contract. But what, the, what they've gotten kind of into a custom of doing a year. is doing year, you know, giving year extensions. And then, you know, so they'll address the issue of compensation, which we do do as well as city manager. But they keep putting on an extra year. Well, the problem is that means the superintendent never fully gets evaluated because the, the, they're never in jeopardy for their position. 
you know, I hate to say a baseball metaphor here, but, you know, Alex Gordon sure as hell played really great before that contract negotiation and really poorly afterward. Yeah, but true. the idea here is, now, the school board can discuss whether that's a good structure for them, but that's always keeping that four-year gold parachute there. In this particular instance, we're taking it substantially further mm -hmm. because we're saying by implication, once the city manager is hired, they are not fired. It is an indefinite term until eventually they quit or <coughs> six of eight removes. And that almost, I mean, you could even have a bad city manager. As long as they make two, fr three friends, they're good. And so, the, you know, I mean, again, I hate to play this out this way. So all Jim's got to do is get Charlene, Joe, and I, and he sat for a while. And so... <laughs> he's not worried because he's doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, very true. But That's but why he's not worried this is right now. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> say when they a affirm the job. <laughs> yes. um, but the idea here is, with the indefinite term, I, job, I would Brownie. actually... <laughs> I want to jump it's right to discussion on this. <laughs> I'm going to make a motion that that whole sentence, no, you're it easy. the person appointed <laughs> shall serve for an indefinite term, be removed in its entirety. <laughs> so the employment agreement is with the city manager and the council, and they negotiate the term. If the council has confidence, they may extend it to the degree they want. If they don't, they may shorten it, but eliminate the indefinite term component. Is there any RS some other dictates to that? There is there? not. Okay. The, uh, <coughs> and, and just from the standpoint of the person sitting in the chair, that right now the city manager's contract, my contract with the city council, which is public knowledge, um, I insisted on having a term right now. So I actually serve on a, a five-year term that is reviewed and cancelable in any given year following my evaluation by the council. And I just think that that makes good business sense on the part of the council. And doing so does not violate the charter because the party's made by consent. Because this is, this would be, the, him choosing not to enforce this section is a detriment to him. He consented to the detriment. That's a unique situation. Mr. Burke. I wanted to say that I would be um, less. How about this? Before you get okay. into a discussion, All right. since there's a motion, is there a second to the motion? Well, I didn't hear that. What lead motion? to discussion? Was your, the, did you I made the motion to okay. remove that sentence. Wait, I was probably I didn't hear it all. You made the, the move to remove what? The sentence that says, the person appointed shall yes. serve in the, uh, for an indefinite term. I didn't realize mm -hmm. that was a motion. Well, I got out. I didn't even get that far. I got where it said appointed by the mayor. Well, I we're not to, that mayor. Point, <laughs> uh, not to that point yet. So it, I it, it, do I have a second or does my motion second. die? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion to second. Now we're at a discussion point. Mr. Burke. The only time that I would be hesitant I, I, the city manager is such a, a important position that in a case of where there was a vacancy in the um, assistant city manager, I would be very hesitant to want to remove a city manager unless we had an assistant already hired or in place, if, if everyone understands, because Business must go on every day. This is this is a this is a service organization. It's certainly with with water and everything else. Um, I think it would be very difficult for the city to run without a city manager and an, an assistant city manager, um, and not have things fall. Um, and I. Is your concern I don't know addressed that, though by the fact of the six out of eight? or the indefinite term? I really don't know where that thought would go. and okay. But it is something that I wanted to bring up. I start with the very beginning, the very first sentence. I don't think that the city manager should be appointed by the mayor because he should be appointed by the council. He works for the council. He doesn't work for the uh, 
the mayor. He, he is our employee, therefore we should be the one that hires and fires. So I would take, I would remove the mayor part on that at all. Well, Ms. Schumacher, that's, <coughs> that's not the motion on the table. The motion is no, just but I'm thinking, I started from okay. the right. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll address that so in, you're talking as a future issue. Okay. Okay. You're talking about the, yeah, I, about the indefinite term. Correct. Mm -hmm. I, so, did, I did the same thing that you did. Right. What? I jumped to the middle. We will go back okay. to the beginning. But one okay. of the problems that we have on that is uh, under the acting city uh, manager, the mayor can... Uh, eliminate the city manager's choice and I guess also the council's choice because he's the one that makes the decision of, of who it's going to be. But that it, has nothing to do with whether the city manager will serve for an indefinite term. Well, doesn't Missouri have a right to work law that, that preempts anything like that? But that, that, does, that is not in conflict with this okay. and our charter dictates. So, so I'm out of order right now. Okay. Just, just, yeah. like, just, just like I was. Wonderful discussion for <laughs> within this paragraph, different sentence. Okay. That's right. I was just curious, what is it, why is that there to be ended with? What is the history of putting that there? Is there a reason? I would prefer Mr. Zur answer that. Mr. Tribune, do you have any history on that? I have no idea. It's not like a story from the meeting. Oh. Um, what, what seems consistent when we were discussing this with previous council was the idea that this was inserted because we didn't want to constantly flip city managers because we've had some city managers who have clashed with council or the mayors and we don't like the idea that, you know, let's put it to you this way. How many ball keep, uh, football or baseball teams do well when they're constantly changing their managers? So we want to keep some con continuity there. This is the key employee of the city. This is the person that all the department heads answer to. They hire all of them. If we're changing over city managers on a year or biannually basis, we're ch in essence going to be changing over a lot of staff underneath. It creates instability. So it sounds like I'm now defending the idea of this indefinite term. I think what needs to happen though is the council needs to, on its own, say, you know, if we have a young city manager, that city manager may want to move soon. Um, we had an assistant city manager who had an opportunity to move to a higher position. Wasn't a secret that because of her age that might occur. Um, but then we may want a city manager where we say we're comfortable with this person. We want to give them a five or eight or ten year contract then the council can kind of dictate that term. I don't like the idea of infinite. I, I think that's a little too broad because then literally the city manager could, could be bad on purpose, sabotage the city, and the city has no way to get rid of them. So it's, the pendulum swung too far in the other direction. Mr. Burke. I, I support your uh, motion, and um, but is there a question to this, is there a system in place for a professional improvement plan or, or something like that if there was a city manager where there was a concern from the council and the mayor? Is there a way to help a city manager understand the concerns and be able to address them and improve before just saying, well, we don't like you, you're fired? Yes, but you have an existing employment. We already have a contract that? with him, and we can have that as an established condition of that. The issue, though, is of term. Okay. So I don't know, Mr. Can I Ritter, what is the term of your existing contract? Five years. Five years renewed each year. Right. So I, I support if a action. corrective action plan is required, that can be a part of that discussion. But if it's an indefinite term, that person can go, I don't care, because even if you don't like it, the only purpose is if I don't honor the plan, is that making anybody else in the room angry? because you got to get to six to get rid of me. Mm -hmm. that, that actually helped me even more so when I supported it. We had a situation where we did we let the um, city manager, the city administrator go, and we didn't have a replacement, so we hired an outside contractor to come in for several months <coughs> and run the city while we were looking around to find a new uh, replacement. Yes, 
but in this particular instance, why I, I, I mean, removing that term does not imply termination. I will say that I think it's behoove of the council, since they're supposed to be kind of the employer of the city uh, city manager, that. Before you fire somebody, you better know whether there's an assistant or whether you got a mechanism in place while they're not there. Otherwise, that's short-sighted management on the on the part of the council. So, uh, but I think that's more relevant to the six of eight discussion that we'll get to. Um, anybody else have any additional comments regarding the indefinite term sentence? I, I'm opposed to the indefinite term because I think I think nobody should have Nobody knows where they stand on an indefinite term. And I think that the city manager would, would like to know the decision as well as the council wants to know. We need to have some, some place to start with. And if we've got a five-year contract, a two-year or whatever we want to make it, we can at least start from that. Agreed. But I don't think we should just do anything indefinitely. Any other thoughts? Seeing none, would, oh, yes, Mr. Stitt. Would you need to, when we take indefinite term out, would you need to define the city manager's term of employment within this? Well, technically, since we already do it by contract, uh -huh. it already occurred. <coughs> that takes care of it. So it kind of already, by implication, takes care of it. Okay. Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Okay, it passes unanimously. Okay. Now, Ms. Schubach, you raised a concern over the first sentence. Yes, it says it should be appointed by the mayor with the advice and consent of the six out of eight members. I'm opposed to that because, as I said earlier, the city manager is our employee. It is not the employee of the um, mayor. So that I think it should eliminate the words mayor and just have it as the city council because that's what it is. That's what the action is. Okay, Mr. Burke, before I call on you, okay. we technically would be helpful to have a staff report here. So Mr. Fairborn, I'll right. kind of uh, ad hoc ask you, could you please explain exactly what your role is with the council and with the mayor? Um, <clears throat> I, serve, uh, I serve as the city's only employee at the pleasure of the council. Uh, again, the terminology that is in here is is pretty clear. Um, the the role of the mayor's interaction with me within the mayor's section is clearly defined. Um, at no point can the mayor give me direction on his own, although we do consult on things. We discuss and under normal circumstances, just my style is um, I will bring all of the agenda items to the mayor for discussion, and the mayor and I kind of jointly set the agenda. Um, but any council member at any given time can ask that something be placed on the agenda, and it's going to be placed on the agenda. That's another section of the, of the code, if you will. But the, the employer, bluntly put, the employer of the city manager Employer, the, the person who employs every other employee of the city is the city manager. Okay, thank you. Mr. Burke. I'd like to make a motion that in this sentence that we change the word with after the word mayor to the word after. So it would read, there shall be a city manager appointed by the mayor after the advice and consent of six out of the eight members of the entire city council. Why would the mayor of Rudy appointing us at all? I'm not sure what were, what would the role of the mayor be then if the council already voted him on? Uh, no. Welcome I to the city. The way an ordinance works in the city, and that, mm -hmm. that language may be a good point, starting point for discussion. An ordinance with the city, the council, for instance, if there's an agreement, the council directs the mayor to sign an agreement. The council directs the mayor to sign my contract. The council directs. So, technically 
this bad. I mean, we, we may be getting way down into the weeds with the term of points, but the council first acts, then the mayor, the mayor acts on their action. It's a celebratory kind of thing. Well, and it's an execution yeah, step. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And mm -hmm. so that I actually concur, Mr. Kessel. Yeah, I was going in that direction because I've been hearing that this advice and consent reference is been considered rather a weak statement. Actually, I thought it was pretty declaratory with the advice and consent. I like consent. That means agreement. The mayor cannot operate in a vacuum. He's not asking for permission, although he needs permission to do that, to make that appointment. Well, I think I would also recognize it's not just the consent, but it's consent of six of eight. Right. So yeah. that speaks with authority as well. Right. Um, that's a very good point. Uh, Mr. Berg, getting back, because you are making a motion, mm -hmm. um, would you consider, since it has not been seconded yet, would you consider changing the word appointed because technically at that point, as, as just brought up, the, the advice and consent of counsel is who hires, but the person that signs the, signs the employment or executes the agreement and does the ministerial act of that is the mayor. Well, it's not an act of appointment. Uh -huh. It's really, a, you know, there, there shall be a city manager I think we need to take out appointed by the mayor, where you know there there shall be a city manager um, would, would uh, employed would by the advice and consent of six to eight members of the council, what an agreement executed by the mayor. Right. Why do Why do you say it on that board? Why can't you just say that by the council instead of by the advice and consent? Because. Advice and consent means that, to me means that I am giving you permission to do something, and that's not really yeah. what we're coming. And, and that's with. true. That's a uh, that's a subsequent act right. to an initial act. Yeah, because that, that's that's say that's going back to what we we're talking about back over here. That the advice and consent, the mayor still rightfully can say, well, that's great, but I don't really care what you have to say. I'm going to do this, and so. It is defined later by the six of the eight here in the next following words, but advice and consent was more of a custom and not a written rule, mm -hmm. is how we explored it 25 minutes ago. So really, you could just either you know, remove it because it says, you're, we're already establishing that the six of the eight are the one, well, the city council are the ones that are, it's not it's advice and consent, it is guidance. It is right. telling you to. Because it's there's no advice and consent; it's demanding. Mr. Burke, I'd ask that you not make a motion. I would withdraw. The following, <laughs> I, I was considering withdrawing it already. I would ask that staff put together language based upon our idea that mm -hmm. the council is who um, makes the decision, not the with mayor. the execution of the, by the mayor. But let staff create language for us consistent with what I know your motion would be. That would be great. And then we kind of go with that instead well, of us trying to handcraft language at this point. Yes, Aren't we talking about appointments? We are removing the, the city appointment. manager appointed by the council. Well, we are removing the mayor's appointment and changing the language to put the council hires. The mayor would only execute the agreement. Right. Ceremony. Okay. So would it yeah, but be, let's wait till we get okay. more yeah. defined language because we may want to play with that. In the I, same way that a city clerk would, would sign something off as it wasn't for a duty. Correct. It's a ministerial duty to a, a okay. different act. Similar to certifying an election. You should also check state statute to make sure that the advice and consent language is not contained in the state statute applied to all cities. That is a wonderful recommendation uh, offered by staff. Uh, before we get out of this sentence, though, there is a subcategory here of these six of eight that Mr. Wiggins brought up. So let's let's kind of work through that because I know that once we talk about bringing them in at six of eight or another number, then we'll probably have some discussion of how they leave at what number. So, Mr. Wiggins, I'll turn it to you. I, I think I've made my point earlier, more or less, that as has been discussed many times in earlier sections, uh, we have changed the language to to five of eight instead of six of eight, um, which I, I just, I made a note, does this need to be five of eight question mark, and following some of the uh, discussion 
earlier about how difficult it is to remove um, somebody if that need be. That would also technically make it easier, still not very easy, but um, just following other changes that we are recommending in the charter, uh, five of eight. So I just didn't know if that should uh, correspond or is there a particular reason um, that it needs to be six. It, 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 may not, it may not be. Pointed by the people. The people actually circulated their petition to say they wanted it to be six of eight. Okay, but historically that was based on a, a conflict between a mayor and a city manager and we had some terminations, people were brought back. I mean, it, there was a lot of clash between that and so it went to a vote of the people to go more strictly to six because there was at least a community feeling that the city manager was too conveniently dismissed. On the other hand, the argument could be presented, was that the pendulum swinging too far in one direction? Do we need to bring that back a little more towards the middle? Since we don't have that kind of conflict today. Yeah, and, and like I said, it, the note that I made was because of the previous conversations where we started toning the language from six to five. And we've done that in multiple sections, so should we follow suit and continue that where reference to the council's powers and their council's voting ability sure. has been dropped to five of eight. What Should are anybody's follow? thoughts on that? Mr. Burke? I think that the city manager is such a crucial um, duty for the council to hire, fire, or manage, or what, what have you, that I think that position is more important than the opinion of one or two dissenting opinions of the entire council that I think it sh I think it should stay six of eight uh, because it is such an important part of the city and just exactly earlier I was worried that removal of a city manager when there wasn't someone that could step in to be the acting would be detrimental to a city's operation. Mr. Stinnett? Yes. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. No. Okay. <laughs> I want to make sure I understand sure, the whole purpose of the like six that. to eight is because it very rarely happens. Is, is that my understanding? It, it's to it's is to it, it, it create a high enough hurdle that it prevents a whim. You know, where a prevailing wind mm -hmm. kind of shifts. You know, and I would ever I would really hate it if we <laughs> went to a four four tie and the mayor <laughs> broke it. Because then it could be well, we didn't. I didn't like the bagels at the budget meeting, and you know, three other people agree with me. Uh, we want to. We want to create a. You almost have to earn out, uh, but or earn in. But there can. Is it too strict at six? Should we come to five of the eight, regardless of the mayor? Should we? I mean, where should? I mean, that's kind of I think you're an open-ended question. Yeah, and and I mean. It's more of a question as opposed to an opinion, um, just because I'm trying to follow what we've done in, in the past, but also based on the comment that you made earlier about it's almost, you know, when you have four people every year that are kind of going back and forth, you know, it's almost <laughs> impossible to get six people um, to, to basically to vote one out. So if we had one, especially if we had, hadn't removed the indefinite term, section you know they could essentially just poo poo their job and nobody cares and it's going to be damn hard to get six people so I can do whatever I want because no one's ever going to get rid of me because there's no way you're getting six which is kind of the, <coughs> the comment that you mm -hmm. made earlier so by taking it to five if we did have god forbid a crappy city manager we have an easier way to actually take action because otherwise they're going to stay there forever That's what about the city other, that would be an interesting question. I'm, I'm not entirely sure on that. Uh, I think that might what be... Others, what do other cities... If I could ask that the city staff have, uh, give at least, at least, you know, Belton, Peculiar, Grandview, some immediate charter cities uh, language on that. But now, I will say this. I've only been... I've only worked with two city managers, Eric Berlin and Jim Fearborn, so I would not say anything directly about either of them. But for living in this town 43 years, I've only heard of one instance where 
They got up to five people that wanted to fire, couldn't quite get the sixth. And that's a long history. And that's even with the controversy that you know has bounded previous. Well, and remember, we're we're doing this for the future, not for the past. Correct. So correct. Just to yes, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fearborn came to the council with a self-imposed term limit. I guess by offering you his services for five years with the conditions it came with. Yes. Is that something that it will now be an expect expectation down the road if a new city manager if the position opens up? By removing the indefinite term, that allows both the council and the city manager to define their own length of term. Negotiable. Which, negotiable, yes. Mm -hmm. But it creates equal bargaining power on both sides. Yeah. That this was this was kind of hamstringing the council coming in because you knew you needed a city manager, but boy, once they came in, you you were stuck. And the problem is, is in the, you know, and I will talk a little about Mr. Fearborn personally on this one. Mr. Fearborn was not interviewed. Um, there was discussion whether to put it out, and actually the council. They wanted to communicate that, well, we want to be fair and objective and consider all options, but actually we fear, we, our fear of the unknown was greater than the known, and that we had a degree, enough degree of confidence in, the, in our acting city manager that we've actually then shifted and felt it would be disrespectful to do that, that actually, because he was in essence really the framework that we were evaluating other applicants on and well by definition that means we should offer him the job that we did. So he was not compared to other people. He came in under his own terms other and people other were own value. Him, yes. And so in this particular instance we are we had eight of eight really before he really committed to wanting the job, we asked him so there was, it was a little, there wasn't this, bro but the reason why I say that is, what if we would have had three applicants? I mean, and only three. I mean, every, a lot of, actually, aren't there a number of city manager positions right now mm -hmm. at, are, are, are opened up here within the metro area? Well, what if you get a crappy applicant pool? If any of you have ever worked in HR, you know that sometimes you put the feeler out and you get, uh, you know, three all stars, and sometimes you put it out there and go, oh, can we just throw these away and re republish? I mean, and so you're kind of luck of the draw. Well, that's the purpose of the initial valuation coming in, but do you really want to force the council to have to take the least of all evens and then not give them the ability to change? In this particular instance, Mr. Fearborn was desired to come in, and then there was equal bargaining power. This hamstrung us initially, and if, if, if removing Mr. Fairborn from the equation, if we would have gone out to go to three completely unknown variables, you just never know what. I mean, we've even commented, oh my God, what could have occurred over the last year and a half? Would a job posting have a reference to the term limit, or was it going to say that it's negotiable upon being accepted? Well, the council did not want the, we, we were upset about the indefinite term. And so as a result, I would have probably encouraged the council to kind of leave that out and hope the guy didn't read this. Because <laughs> anybody reading this would go, oh my gosh, I could get that job and as long as I keep three people happy, I'm good to 72. I mean, that is, that, that's scary. But with it in there, you couldn't have done that. Well, that, that I know I was kind of playing the uh, uh, better be silent. <laughs> yes, Mr. Burke. I am, uh, from from my point of view, for for many years, um, it, before I was on this, uh, um, as a, as a council person, um, I I have always been wary of any kind of governing boards that have one employee where they work together, such as a school board or a city council or something like that, because it's very easy to work with someone that is your employee 
but work so well with them that the the council or the board or whatever forgets that they're the employee the employers and this person is the employee and um, so I, I I'm wary of that but still I would not want to change it to five to eight even in light of that and, and, and mr. Burke I'm, I know you're draw you're, you're being very polite about drawing reference to the school board structure uh -huh. Um, but would you not agree that in the last two elections for school board, all the incumbents are being voted out, and one of the criticisms is they're too friendly with the superintendent, not objective in their evaluation. I and agree with so that assessment. In this council, you know, technically now the burden becomes to Mr. Fearborn because while I would like to believe uh, we have a very good working relationship, at least what is demonstrated is very positive. We, you know, in April we could see a, we could see three new members hop on the board. So we could see, you know, right. whatever that percentage comes out to, forty, roughly forty percent shift, in just, you know, uh, uh, two months. Right. And then the year after, four brand new people. I mean, it could, we could see some pretty dramatic changeover just in, in uh, the next fourteen months. And he has to retrain. Because he kind of trains us, right? You know, right. Um, it, uh, please don't take offense, but uh, the, you know, if you look at it from a parent to child standpoint, I think any of us here who've had children went, "Yeah, I'm the boss of the house, and the child is the one that trained us. The child is the one that r dictated the schedule and ruled us as they grew up." Right? I, I never want to admit that. I hope my wife or my daughter doesn't see this, but but. Uh, she I, ran the house. I still I feel the we're position. we're protected by the fact that it says that we are not to interfere with his operations, that we don't give him advice and tell him how he has to do. So that keeps him a little bit separate from us then, where he knows he has to work with us and we know we have to work with him. To get back to the school yes, board um, analogy or issue, um, I have personally asked every uh, candidate for school board for the last five or six elections um, what is the appropriate role between the school board and the superintendent and I just did that last weekend with a, a group and um, it's very interesting to me how many applicants don't realize that the superintendent doesn't employ the school board and it's the school board that employs the superintendent and it's very similar in, in this kind of circumstance as well. Um, when things are going well, it's, I mean, right now things are going very well and our city's booming. Um, it is important every once in a while to step back and go, okay, now let's keep in mind what are, are each of our positions. Um, so I'm, I'm very cognizant of that, of that possible problem that could occur with too much collegiality and not enough professionalism in, in employment. But um, I still feel that this is a good process. So you do you support five or six? Six. Okay. Um, I, I want to play devil's advocate briefly mm -hmm. and then kind of get to an exact number here. Because, uh, Mr. Burke, I think you bring up a very good point. Right now, things are great. We feel very good. Um, without getting into specifics, but you know, so I, the council would not feel that Mr. Fearborn would be in jeopardy even if we lowered this to five. But Mr. Fearborn and Mr. Holman, I believe, would appreciate this reference. He could turn to the dark side and embrace, you know, he could join the first order. Um, and if he, you know, and if that happened, yes, it's, there you go. If, if that happened, you did that really well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do we, you know, do we stick with the six of eight because we feel, or five of eight, or whatever we end up choosing because things are good, but that number has to equal to be effective if it's bad. So from that standpoint, what are I think your it's, I think it's got to be data driven, and that data needs to drive the discussion of those eight council members, uh, not emotionally driven. It needs to be based on actual job performance data, not the whim of a people on their emotions. 
It needs to be based on the actual, is the job being done according to the specifications of what the job entails. There's still subjectivity, so it's really not either way. But that you, would... You can, you, can put a, you can put a control in there, but if the control's not fired, you're, you're going to get a motion regardless of, of what side of the table somebody sits on. Sometimes it takes years to make change. Um, I worked for years to get to change the grading system in, in, our, in our district. Um, and it took years, but we finally accomplished that political goal. Um, if there is a strong need, whether a person is a council member or, or just a citizen, I think if someone wants to work hard enough and they have actual evidence to support that opinion, evidence can, can overwhelming, it may take more than one person's <coughs> term, but if that is really, even if someone was to go out there and put that position out, lose their position on council, they could continue to use that data and continue to look at that and try to sway public opinion. And if someone doesn't want to uh, put that effort out, then apparently it's not really that big of a deal to make a change. Ms. Shubar. I went on the internet right after I went and came on the council and read some of the different evaluations that was done. And I don't know why it was on the, in public, but it was. And I saw, what I saw was in some instances they'd say, well, we like our city manager because, and then they would give an emotional reason for it. Some of the others that were the more professional, they would say, all right, his salary or his work at Lowers is based on the amount of revenue that he has brought in on economic development. And so they had actual figures that they could go by to determine whether he was doing the kind of job they want. They had spelled out what is his, the parameters in which he had to do. So many people re represented so much, something that, and they could check off them because they had facts, they had data. It was not, well, I like the way that he wears his hair or anything like that, you know. So. And, and you know, respectfully, as a teacher, every year I pour over the student evaluations, and every year somebody will say, I like Mr. Moorhead's ties. So unfortunately, there's always going to be a council member that's going to when like I, his sweater does. Mm -hmm. When I first ran, they said they'd give it, it was the color of my hat that they yes, talked about. Yes, and you have, been, you have actually had comments about your hat. I, I, Mr. Echo, yes. I don't mean to cut. Please, no. I'm just curious. Help me, help me understand this. If we change this to five to eight, I'm looking down the road not right now. And the city manager is doing an outstanding job. He's going to be, I use the word, he's going to have his job anywhere. If it's a five-year term, do well, he, how, how many? It can be terminated. We can terminate it. That's if, not a if guaranteed he does a contract. Great job, if he does a bad job, right, right. But if he does a good job and it's five to eight, they just continue to do a good job. Am I missing something? If I change, you understand what I'm saying? If it's six to eight, makes it difficult for a bad person. Five to eight will make it easy for a bad person and good for a good person. You understand right. what I'm saying? Is right. that right? Is it? Yeah. To, to, to re-up his contract. To, yes. yeah. After his five years, years to give him a two-year yeah. extension, it's easier to get five people than six, because if you have two people that are on council who are those people that we really don't want on council, and they're, you know, it's, it'll be easier with five than six. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the flip side of it, right. is that it, it helps us to retain good talent by dropping the number. And help us get rid of that Sorry. It's easier to get easier rid of to them. Get rid of um, it's not as favorable <clears throat> to a good candidate because it's much easier to get rid of a bad uh, person. Um, it, it provides more, it, it's kind of like the tenure argument. It provides more job security when it's difficult to fire them. I will say that we have a couple of checks and balances here. One of the checks and balances is as because we've removed the indefinite term, it comes up for full review after five years. Right. So therefore, if you can't get six, you just got to get to the next contract to go to okay, renegotiation. Did I misunderstand that, or is it re renewable or reviewable? It's, re it's reviewable. Reviewable. But not Compensation renewable. is reviewed every year, not the term. 
And you, I, can, you can determine the annual deductible. Yes. Yeah. And I would also point out when we were discussing when we were discussing the difficult position that we were in with this situation in previous meetings, not specific to a city manager. One of the things that I pointed out was that if you look on the, I believe it's the seventh sentence down, the city manager shall be compensated as established by the council. My remark was I couldn't get rid of the city manager in the hypothetical we were discussing, <laughs> so I got five of the eight to agree to only pay him $10,000 a year. Do you think they're going to stick around? So do you sour, now is that at, is that negotiating in bad faith? I yes. can see that argument. I mean, yeah, I'm be, not saying know. that's a great position, but Easily enforcing that language was what I was trying to stress, yeah. that that is a big part of it. So we do evaluate every year for compensation reasons, but the actual um, term, term has been independently set. The question is, is if we keep it at six, because we've removed the indefinite term, we actually have the several checks and balances now, both in compensation as well as the term of the contract that allow a check and balance. But at the same time, I can I would posit, I'm not sure moving to five of eight, again, not having the mayor break a tie, but actually five council members, I, I don't think that's that harmful. So I, I have no opinion. So respectful, I think you guys gave me what I wanted, which was the indefinite term concern, because I think that creates some, some balancing of scales. Okay, so now that we've fleshed this out quite a bit, though, does anyone wish to extend a motion? Or do we keep it at six? I think we had a good discussion. Seeing no, seeing no motion, we'll move on. Um, for clarification, I'm assuming that means the removal of six of eight is kind of also discuss, was discussed. And so we were talking about bringing them in at six of eight, but I think didn't we kind of hit both? Yeah, and, and my question was regarding both, not not one or the other. Okay. It's kind of the, the, the in general. The final two sentences deal with residency. So, is there a concern about the man mandating of them being a resident and that they have one year to move in? I think it's reasonable, and it should. I, I think it should be expected that they. I mean, if they're going to be the the head of you know the the movings and in and outs of the city, they should they should live here. Well, and there is that last sentence as well that yes. provides. Leeway. That can be waived by the count by a percentage six of eight of the council. Well, in, in this case, it's three waived, fourths. It'll be waived permanently. Waived permanently, one year or permanently. But you also got to get six people convinced that it's okay for that person to live in Lee Summit, right. as opposed to moving over here. Which I think they probably live somewhere. Now. No. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I agree. I, with I, almost, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> I, I agree with the residency. Uh, we are we are a complex enough community today that actually our, one of the comments made last night was we believe that Chief Zimmerman should start because we have somebody who is parking their car up here on the weekends, a red truck up here on the weekends, <laughs> and that should be ticketed for leaving their car up here on the weekends. Abandonment of people. Even on Sundays. Sunday. <laughs> so say I noticed it up here on Super Bowl Sunday when I had to come file a police report. <laughs> yes. So so based on current track record, we have a city manager who is here very and now that is his work ethic. Not every city manager needs that. But if we did have somebody living thirty minutes away with some of the emergencies and exigent circumstances that we do face, I would encourage that if they're not living in Raymore they better be about four blocks outside of city limits so they can get here real close. So, so he's actually just living at the office, right? I, I, this is his residence. That's usually just, just head, head coaches yeah. living under myself. their desk. I, I, the only breach of, uh, of probably protocol that I'm going to make is I have publicly made the statement that I am not concerned that he is happy. 
I am concerned that this is fear boy is happy. <laughs> so I would like to see him home more, but I also respect his balance and what, how he does it, and he does quite fine. And we're happy with it, but we do we don't want him living up here. If he ever petitions for a bed, then we'll draw the line Coffee. for sure. Yeah, exactly. Mr. Wilson, uh, just a question quickly is that if in fact this city manager's job is ever posted, a vacancy occurred, and wouldn't wouldn't the information regarding residency be one of the things that would be a requirement post in the posting yes. itself? Yes. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So it would be transparent from the point mm -hmm. that someone applied to <coughs> residency requirement. And, yes. and I can tell you this is almost universal. So yeah. I mean, there are whole mm -hmm. conversations at ICMA relative to this issue. Uh, I, it's it's Last year, there were discussions about it being an ICMA tenant, and it, I, to, to just simply enforce what is already in place in all the cities, because it, at that level with our organization, anybody, anybody who proposed otherwise better have a very, very good reason. And that reason should not be that their council wants them so bad that they're willing to do something because that's not protecting the council. Okay. With that being said, and I appreciate everybody kind of put in a little extra time tonight, we were able to get through Section 5.1. We will have some small staff recommendations regarding language that they're going to go over. Um, so for the next agenda, Article 4 will not even be referenced on the agenda. Only 5.1 in old business for the staff reports, and then we will do 5.2, 5.3, and I actually am confident that we get through Article 6 in its entirety. Any? When yes, is our sir. next meeting date? March. March 7th. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Putting that on here, sorry. Actually, the same date as so February 15th. Oh, all right. I don't remember what that was. Okay. Um, I'm, because of the time frame here, I, I think the status update in the agenda is more informative than needing discussion. We don't need other. We have no members of the public. I was not really sure. aware that we needed to be done and have this in the hands of the city council by June the whatever the date is in there. Because when we started out on this, we started it could be this long or it could be this long. It just depends. So when and where did this June date pop up? Um, staff had included resolution 16-27 in our work packet for tonight. And um, I believe if you look at the calendar, um, there was some, if you look at section G, the first sentence on the second page, that we're expected to complete by June. I don't believe that it would be out of bounds if we needed to have an extra meeting or two uh, to go to the council and ask for an extension on that. But there, sh if you look at H, that we've kind of there is a deadline as far as November election um, that we have to be sensitive sensitive of an H and I. So. The, the, really what we would almost have to do at this point is have more meetings. Um, I believe right now, since we've kind of gotten past the mayor, I think we're picking up a lot of speed. If you look at subsequent articles, some of these will do two and three at night. So I think if we, tonight we move through a lot of different discussions. If we keep that flow, I don't. we don't have to do more than two a month. If it gets to the point at the end of March that we're still sitting like in Article 6 or 7, we may have to add a, add a meeting or two. So we'll play it by ear. Article 6 is a half page, so. Yes, uh, if we can't get through that, then I'll have to find Then we're in trouble. Then we're in trouble. 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 We're in trou